<laughs> it is May the 15th, 2021, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Hello, hello, hello. We are back with The Future of Photography, episode 181. LDR, SDR. Okay, this is going to be a technical episode for sure. Um, Adrian with me? Jeremiah with me? Yep, hello. hi. How's everyone doing? Imar is hiding. Imar is hiding. When, whenever we... <laughs> She's pick, working, isn't she? <laughs> she is. Pick highly technical stuff. Oh! <laughs> no, no, no. 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 Not necessarily. I mean, of course, uh, that, that is kind of the running joke here, but... But actually, Imar, we're kidding. Yeah, we're kidding. We're kidding. And, and she's busy, doing work. She's doing work. So yeah, yeah, she's we right. have to do without Imar um, just having her up here in not not as well as a little robot. And um, so we'll be talking about LDR, SDR, and HDR, which um, yeah is something that is, comes and goes and has different contexts and different meanings to different people because those terms are kind of being used especially the hdr term is kind of being used in different ways and means different things and uh so i think we want to bring a bit of light into the dark no pun intended here mm -hmm. using um, hdr using <laughs> hdr that's it um <laughs> so yeah ldr load load dynamic range standard dynamic range and h uh, high dynamic range um mm -hmm. How do you, uh, uh, we should explain what that is? Yeah, how do how, how are we going to approach are... this? How I uh, well, uh, the, the I thought that maybe we could. Uh, well, the first thing we need to get out of the way is is the thing that photographers all carry with them as baggage at this point, which is the stuff that we've been told is high dynamic range imagery, and uh, the stuff that. Uh, sorry, the stuff, the images that, uh, if taken too far, can make you feel quite, quite queasy. Actually, it's, it and certainly gets a lot of voices on the internet shouting at you. That's a very that nice way of putting it. That's a very nice way of putting it. Um, <laughs> many people hate it. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, some people why love don't it. We de uh, shall we just have a, a quick definition of what dynamic range is? Um, yeah, go for we it. Talk about high or low. Uh, you know, dynamic range um, is a term not only for photography, but for sound and performance. But it, uh, I would, if you one looks at a graph, the dynamic range would be the lowest point on the graph to the highest point on the graph, and everything in between is the dynamic range that is either captured. Yeah, that's a very light. good broad definition of dynamic range. I like yeah, that a lot because yeah. so our, yeah, <laughs> our, our our sensors on our cameras are able to capture a certain amount of low light before they block up in shadows and become black, and a certain amount of high lights before they blow up and become nothing. And we have that, that here when we talk into a microphone, we can be very, very soft or very, very loud. And that thing in between, <laughs> that's the dynamic range between the lowest and the highest, pretty much. That's true for audio, so it, that's true for video, that's true for photography, for for monitors, and so on. That's Cinema it. cameras, we always look for something that will extend the dynamic range, whether it's film, which has expanded its dynamic range over the course of years. Uh, uh, microphones it means the ability to capture uh, a, a a broad spectrum of uh digits in our case mm -hmm. whether they be sonic or visual yeah no, it's it's so interesting because of course what you know for the last 10 years or so possibly more at this point yeah you know, there's been a thing called hdr in the world of photography um, can i can i just uh, bring uh, up some photos i've just i've just gone to Flickr oh, yes. and uh typed hdr ah. in the search box just oh, oh, just I'm so oh, my scared. Eyes. oh wow it's hurting my eyes yeah. well and that's that's okay. kind of the, the type of imagery we're looking at very strong colors well, the cars, so weird so cars, that yellow car stuff weird so, contrast so let's have a, yeah. 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 Let's let's talk about how this happens, right? So yes, because let's this do. is let's, let's yeah, put apart, them away. Apart again. from apart from over Oops. enthusiasm, let's let's talk about how this happens because they, they, those images actually, you know, they they're referred to as high dynamic range because they can give you details in the shadows of the image and details in the highlights of the image, but actually the way they do that is to compress 
uh, all of the image such the so, so that the the darks are not really dark at all they're actually a lot brighter and the and the highlights are not bright at all they're actually a, a lot a lot lower in their luminosity or their luminance um, and actually what you've got there is is a really small dynamic range or for the purposes of this podcast a low dynamic range image yeah. and so this is not only do i uh, not only do i not like it when that type of imagery is overdone it also is really poorly named, if you ask me, and that really winds me up. Well, it, the the reason is because the first step to making these kind of images is what's called an HDR image. You have a you have a format that you can squeeze a lot of uh, different exposures into, and that's how you usually take them. You take multiple exposures, one that mm -hmm. has all the detail in the shadows, and uh, and one that has all the detail in the highlights and then you have the computer merge them into this high, di uh, high dynamic range photo which you cannot look at on your monitor or most monitors because most screens don't support hdr it's getting better oh you're jumping ahead worse. you're jumping ahead there I, I, I don't, I don't want to jump ahead but but what <laughs> happens then is a second step and that's usually ignored and that's called tone matching where you you squeeze that really vast dynamic range in that file into the dynamic range that a piece of paper the can show. Or or monitors of capable yeah. of. So and that's that's how this ends up having a much lower dynamic range because it has to fit into the output of well of whatever we use to look at it. Of whatever display. Yeah. Well let's let's uh, talk about that actually because that's a really good segue. So uh yeah can I si just si sidebar another uh definition or something that will help. Of course. Uh, and before we jump in completely and, and Go for it. put our bodies into this, the gamma, um, which has a lot to do, we should we should get into what gamma is and, and because the capabilities of capture and the capabilities of display are different. And what we're talking about here is the kind of uncanny valley, <laughs> if I could use a weird term here. Uh, between what is possible for our eyes, for our capture mechanism, and for our display, it will be different however we display it and what kind of tools we use to capture. Trying to fit it all together into something that appears to be naturalistic is the challenge, and often it's more difficult to create something that is um, visible in what we would call um, kind of our normal perception than it is to do something extreme. And, and so um, gamma, which it, people have different um, approaches to what that is, but in, for example, on a cinema camera, that, that gamma, which is, um, let's, let's call it, what is the black point of, of, of an image? Like what, it, what is true black? Um, I have a monitor, uh, the gamma is set at 2.2. That's, that's a neurological, spiritual <laughs> identity of my monitor of how it, it um, confirms the black point so that there is some kind of unity of other displays. So if your display is at 2.2 black and mine is, you won't look, be looking at something that is gray or milky or overly crushed. And that relates to high dynamic range as well, Ooh. or dynamic range. Definitely. Anyway, I thought that, that would be a, the sidebar article on the slide. <laughs> oh, no, please, thank proceed. You. please proceed. Please, please, please proceed. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I tell you what. So we've talked about low dynamic range, which is which is a bit of a play, really, that, that actually what we've all been told is called high dynamic range imagery is, is is actually not when we when we view it um and it's but it's a good point though uh jeremiah bringing up displays because it, of course you know there is a difference between what our cameras can capture and what our displays uh, can show us and that's where there's a lot of technical stuff that goes into this so first of all you know not not quite a history lesson because most of us are still operating or many screens are still operating at this level but let's talk about first standard dynamic range okay so uh the the standard dy dynamic range uh, refers to the the brightness that your screens or your displays are capable of so what is the difference in brightness from from a black to to from a pure black to to a pure white uh and 
Brightness in this case is measured in a marvelous unit called candelas per square meter, um, otherwise known as a nit. <laughs> I've I've heard this term several times. Hey, say hello. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, we so, uh, and I think many people will have heard the term nit. Yes. Yeah, so so for the, for the purposes of this conversation, uh, the unit of a, a nit is a measure of the brightness uh, that your display is capable of producing. And in standard dynamic range, uh, it, the the upper limit of brightness is roughly 100 nits um i say roughly because displays are capable of different things but this yeah as a standard uh, standard dynamic range will have a cap of 100 nits that means that you have a certain amount of range from from 0 to 100 that your display is capable of and that you when you play uh, images still images moving images whatever it is the and and the display has to to uh, provide brightness then that's what it's capable of um that gives uh, a, a good baseline just to to move into what high dynamic range is, because it, yeah, high dynamic range is, is in part defined as the, the, the difference between that and standard dynamic range. So if standard dynamic range is capable of a brightness of 100, um, high dynamic range is capable of a brightness of far more than that. Um, typically today, uh, an HDR display. So, uh, you know, perhaps this is a fancy television that you've bought quite recently that is that is uh, capable of being much brighter. Or perhaps, as as in my case, uh, it is an iPhone 12, uh, which is capable of, of going much brighter. Um, these can do, roughly speaking, uh, 1,000 nits of brightness. So that's 10 times. Uh, the brightness that's that a, a standard definition sorry a standard dynamic range uh screen is capable of and uh you know so all of that hdr um because a black is still a black right so all of that high dynamic range is actually at the high end so you get you know you, you get a huge amount more range an order of magnitude more brightness that you can make uh available in your screens now um HDR will go even higher. This is an evolving technology. So uh, actually, often today, some some content is mastered at four thousand nits, which is, of course, you know, forty times what you've got in your standard old uh, old televisions. Um, and uh, yeah, there's there's not many screens that can hit that sort of level. But even if there aren't. Um, if you have an HDR display, it will typically be capable of at least 10 times as much brightness as a standard dynamic range display. 10 times, right? That That's quite a lot, right? <laughs> it, it is. It is. Um, what I find interesting is that when you go outside on a sunny day, the dynamic range of that scene between the deepest shadows and whatever is being lit by the sun directly, like a white wall being lit by the sun, that is even drastically higher than that. So we are only Absolutely. approaching that. We're not even in the in the ballpark yet, but uh, it's getting us closer to what the real world looks like in terms of that dynamic range. I'm, gu I'm guessing we don't That's want to right. go too far, do we? Because if our TVs were as bright as the sun, we wouldn't be allowed to look at them. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, part, part of it is uh, what I was saying before is it's very difficult to create a, an image that appears to have the dynamic range of what the natural eye will, will, will perceive. Um, we have an extra added tool as humans that allow us to perceive high dynamic range exterior, and that's our brain. Hmm. Um, in any one particular um, focus of our eye, do we really see all of the brights and all of the shadows? I think our attention. It, it is that. It is that. And it's also the chemistry in our eyes, interestingly enough, because what our eye does is it does local adaption to brightness. So you have this... Right. this Pretty much what, what the tone mapping is in, uh, in the HDR photography... Um, this is what our eyes do. This is one of the reasons when you look at something bright and then you look away to something else, you see an after image because the chemistry in your eye has to kind of flush out and uh, normalize again. So our eyes, I mean, this, this whole, our whole perception apparatus is just an amazing marvel. 
Yes, and also we have a automatic iris control. That too, we yes. Do. We do. Uh, so, so it, you know, it's like going from outside very, very, very bright to inside. Everything is like completely dark. We're stumbling around for a few minutes while our iris readapts and we start to see detail in the shadows and then everything normalizes. So again, the human... Um, the human experience of sight and dynamic range is markedly different from our tools. And that's what we're here to try and unpack. Yeah, that's a really, it's, it's good Good to compare it to, to the real world, you know, to, to the things outside in the sunshine, to, to the way our eyes work. Because, of course, yeah, we are talking about something that is only a, a fraction uh, of all of that. Um, but you know, it just if I tried to sum up the you know, the, if somebody said you know, so so what is is you know, HDR in this sense, um, I, I would say you know simply that you know an HDR display is capable of being a lot brighter than a standard dynamic range display, uh, and you know t at the moment as we record this in, in May twenty twenty one. Typically, an HDR display will be 10 times as bright uh, as your ordinary display, but it could be, depending on how much money you spend, up to about 40 times as bright uh, as a traditional display. So yeah, that, that's kind of the, the, state, of the state of the technology uh, as we talk about this today. Um, and it's not that it's just bright, because bright has a double-edged meaning here. A bright could be the amount of light that's being blasted into our eyes, but it also <laughs> should mean how much of the higher value of light it is capable of rendering some detail in. So yeah. when, when something has a high value in terms of, quote, a screen brightness, it means white there are many kinds of whites and there are many kinds of blacks and they they shade very gradually and very specifically where a less expensive monitor will go from uh a black to a dark gray to a medium gray to a gray etc uh and the same thing on the upper end does that is that a way of kind of yeah yeah and it's just got me thinking actually i wonder what ansel adams would think of all of this stuff <laughs> yeah let, let's 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 not go into the zone system at this point but <laughs> not quite yet <laughs> it is all connected this is all connected it is pretty much all connected yes it, it is it is so um just just a quick thing uh okay because we're talking a lot about displays and of course we all have computer monitors and televisions and uh, and laptops and ipads and phones and all of this sort of stuff uh, and it may well be that you so each of these is marketed with a different HDR standard. Some might say HDR10, some might say HDR10+. Plus. The current Apple thing that they want to go for is called Dolby Vision HDR. Um, all of these are technical standards. Uh, they are effectively uh, technical definitions uh, of what HDR means. Um, and uh, there's a link in the show notes, actually, to a good article that describes the difference between each of these standards. And they are technically different. Um, and if you are producing you know, uh, t television or if you're producing movies, then these things are very, very important to get right. I would have to say, though, that to the average consumer, given the state of the given how close together some of these standards are and also the capability of the products you can buy out there in the marketplace at the moment there's not a lot of difference i think so if you were to look at it if you were to have a tv that said hdr 10 plus versus one that said dolby vision hdr it's probable you wouldn't notice a lot of difference um, uh, especially if you're watching content that was made with a standard dynamic range of course or or streamed to you or broadcast to you you yeah you you certainly wouldn't notice any difference then so so i don't think it's anything to worry about um you know it's just uh but it but it is something you know it is something geeky to to geek out on <laughs> it certainly won't help with a bad show the story well, should in, probably be in, in the foreground <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah it, you know absolutely a, a great show with a, a kind of a very narrow dynamic range is always better than a poor show with a high dynamic range. Uh, so, you know, same thing with images. Uh, you know, we, we know that 
uh, however geeky and technical we get, it, it is not the technology which drives the emotional connection to the work. It's vice versa. However, there are uh, subtleties of exploration within uh, the technicalities that allow uh, some exploration to do new kinds of work within that. And that's very interesting, I think, to all of us here. Yes. Yeah, very much. Okay, right. So having simplified it all down to a matter of brightness, <laughs> um, I now need to complicate all of this stuff slightly again um, by adding colour. <laughs> Because those standards that we've just been talking about uh, are, are not purely about brightness. Uh, they, they are mostly uh, a combination of both brightness and colour gamut, the range of colours that uh, a display is capable of. Um, uh, and uh, let's start with something that is going to be very familiar to photographers, uh, a little thing called sRGB. <laughs> Yeah, that little profile that you pop into your JPEGs uh, to make sure that that, you know, that that browsers can display the right colours. Um, it tends to happen automatically, um, and you know, for people that are relatively new to uh, to photography in the last five years or so, maybe it's not such a thing. But having been through you know the the earlier days of digital myself, as uh, so I'm sure you guys both have, uh, you know, it, there were days when browsers weren't you know uh, colour profile were you know. Um, uh, weren't ready for color profiles couldn't process them and your put your picture would come out different on different screens and the colors would look washed out and oh uh, all, all a bit of a nightmare um, uh, but a little thing called srgb sort of fixed that <laughs> for a lot of us consumers anyway um, okay it, it, uh, it also it also made it a bit worse because it at least for some it made it worse because it could have been better in some contexts and it I think sRGB, uh, I, I like to call it kind of a lowest common denominator of uh, the color spaces. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> there's a there's a link in the uh, in the show notes to to a great diagram that shows the the color spaces. I think I'm going to ask Jeremiah actually because Je Jeremiah, you're you're doing good with our sidebar definitions today. Have you got a to hand a, a definition of a color space? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, sRGB, which which could be a kind of the great uh, neutral vis uh, visual display, uh, call it average. Uh, but if anyone who's tried to make a accurate color print, judging the colors and luminance uh, of an image uh, using sRGB, is going to go through a lot of paper and a lot of control. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I when I do my work, particularly, I have I have a a monitor that allow I have basically three buttons. I could match it to my Apple screen exactly, uh, which is not very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can match it to sRGB, so I can do the average, and I can do Adobe, um, and when I'm working in the Adobe uh, 1998 profiles on the monitor i find that the again it's a it's a different way of interpolating when, and, and displaying color and luminance all of that let me let me it uh, is more direct to the to the printer let me show something here because um that's something um that i like to do um hold on it's just going to take me one second because i want to i want to bring up the actual color spaces and uh ah, yes. so there's a there's a utility here on the Macs called ColorSync utility, and it shows you the color spaces. And interestingly enough, so it's kind of a visualization of what colors belong into that space. So it's you can you can actually 3D look at this. So you can see there's the green and the red and the blue values, and uh, they go from all the way from uh, black to all the way to white and everything in between. And um, they are they are rendered as a as a specific shape here and. This is the Adobe RGB space, which is a relatively large color space. And uh, if you go here and say hold for comparison, then look at sRGB in comparison. Let, let's add sRGB in here. And now you kind of get an idea of the different sizes of color spaces. So um, yeah. you can see that sRGB on the, on the green side is significantly smaller, so it cannot show certain green tones. Um, that other color spaces can. So uh, I, I, I think this is a good way to visualize that they are um, different, very different. 
very very different and and uh yes for i guess just for for the benefit of those on on audio only for this podcast uh yeah the the color space is, as chris says there is, is a is a description or a definition of, of the 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 number and range of colors uh that can be displayed so if you have an srgb here's display, by the way cmyk that, which goes on print uh, on printing it's oh, it's tiny much compared smaller to, again compared to the others so yeah. um the, yeah so it's the range of colors available so that so your color space defines the range of colors available to you uh and uh as we said uh, lowest common denominator so srgb is kind of the lowest common denominator that the smallest color space that photographers will typically work in right um it has a it has a cousin uh, a very close cousin actually called rec 709 uh which <laughs> is uh al almost exactly the the same color space uh but it's the term that is used it's a standard used in the world of video rather Here, than we can the compare world them of stills for everyone who's watching this on oh. on video this is rec 709 and this is okay. srgb so no it didn't see are, any change at all there <laughs> they are virtually the same yeah they are virtually they're not quite I, my understanding uh is that they're not quite the same but again for the purposes of those of us you know making and listening to this podcast it, it pretty much nearest damn it yeah right <laughs> it, it means that certain colors are expanded and others are contracted in terms of their display but uh where it gets very challenging this is again a little bit of a sidebar when you're using cmyk and you're trying to work with a printer a book printer uh, to to create at least something that approximates one's prints or display. You have to work very very carefully at at kind of readjusting your luminance and quality of color and all of that stuff. So the appearance on a book is quite different. Yeah, um, see, it's, and, and starts to come together. There is a well, there's, there's both a the technicality and the craft to it. There's a very funny mm. story relating to this very show, to the future of photography, because if uh, if you look at the logo and at the background color of the logo, this turquoise greenish uh, tint, which I, did, it, I, did, I designed this on this very screen on a P3 color space, which is huge. <laughs> and um, and then I sent this off to, the, to a printer to have uh, stickers made. Well... They didn't turn out the same tone because the CMYK <laughs> they use for the stickers does not have this specific area of green blue. So um, the no, stickers, if, if you ever get your hand on one of the stickers, and I have still a few left, they do not look anything like that color. And I, 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 I got them back and I was like, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. And uh, then I realized I made a huge mistake here. Well, yeah, it's so interesting. Okay, P3. P3 was the next thing on the list. So we talked about the lowest common denominator's color spaces. Uh, P3 is a color space that is, as you say, Chris, is is bigger. Uh, and those uh, those of us with modern displays, uh, modern computer displays, uh, perhaps you have an iPad uh, or, or a modern iMac, as Chris does, uh, and uh, with phones as well. Um, and this is not just a Mac thing, by the way, um, that, yeah, the, these are standards that, you know, the, 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 these are not things that are particularly Apple specific. Um, it's just how I think we all work on Macs. Uh, you, you might have a display that is capable of P3. So capable of displaying a far greater range of colors than something that is just sRGB. Uh, now, that's a, an interesting thing, and it can get you into some bother, as Chris has just d told a little story about. Um, but for HDR standards, um, uh, and yet yeah, we go bigger again uh, to a very large color space uh, known as Rec 2020. Uh, so, you know, the Dolby Vision HDR standard uh, that I spoke about a little while ago, that is the thing that Apple is pushing at the moment, uh, that, that is capable of dealing with brightness levels up to 10,000 nits. Rec and 2020, the, want to see it? Watch oh, yeah, out. Yeah, go for it. And watch out, Rec watch out. Boom, here we go. Whoa, it's It doesn't enormous. even fit the screen. <laughs> it is huge. It is enormous. Right. Okay. So so you know the the Dolby Vision standard as uh, just to to name one HDR standard uh is capable of 10,000 nits and uh Rec 2020 color. 
Now, yeah, that's kind of a bit theoretical uh, because the, there aren't really available the displays that can do either of those things, either the brightness or the or the color, which is why right now uh, you will find that, as I said earlier, you know, for, for brightness, most things will be uh, managed to about a thousand nits. And actually, it's still very common uh, for Rec 709 to be used as the color space. And I believe, Jeremiah, you'll correct me if I'm wrong on here. I believe this is still really the industry standard for both broadcast and streaming. Um, things are, I, I would have to say, things are in flux now okay. um, on the on the streaming side because you're, you're having a move to 4K. And uh, I'm thinking there are going to be 6 and 8K displays very soon. Certainly on the Oculus, there, there's or the Reeve, or some of these new ones are capable of six or eight K, from what I'm reading. Um, on the on the broadcast cycle, whether it's kind of projections, uh, it, I don't think there is. I don't think we've uh, arrived at a standard the way it used to be when we projected film. Um, me and my editor, we used to go to a theater for the first presentation, be able to measure. The screen brightness, we knew what the film brightness is just to make sure the bulbs were tweaked in. They weren't too hot. They weren't too wow. cool. And, and, and so for the first screening of the film in the industry, it would be screened as we had seen it in the lab, thereby kind of. Once you're into, uh, the, it, it, it got a lot easier when we went to digital at first because it was what it was. But now all of these different formats are coming online again, and so I think we're in a we're in a flux period about what what really is a standard. I think we're closest in streaming to a 4K standard on a monitor, so a 4K monitor with 4K streams, and a color space that is. Um, I don't know. I think people are still experimenting with what what yeah. works best in that space. Now I don't think there's anyone who is in you know, in a kind of uh, color finishing mode, you know, in a lab where you're adjusting it, that that they know where where the worst is peaking, and it's usually set to the lowest common denominator. That's mm. how it's always. Yeah, I have I have read in, in my research that uh, some uh, high end movie theaters have now got P three color, um, but I don't think that's, that would be special. Yeah. You know, not 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 particularly standard. So so okay. Well, there we go. Um, you know, we now have uh, we've, we've talked about brightness and we've talked that the HDR specifically as a as a as a technical thing um, relates to brightness. Uh, but then we've talked also about commercial HDR standards, uh, which will include color uh, as well as brightness, uh, and and that's how you get to your HDR ten plus and your. Dolby Vision HDR and things like that. So next time you're in yeah, your, your electrical goods store and you see the stickers that they put on the edge of the television screen saying this, that and the other, um, you know, those things are you know, th those things are evolving. Um, I suspect um, those of us that are more concerned about buying good computer monitors for for photography or for, for filmmaking um you know there's there's a there's good good technical geeky rabbit hole to dive down on this stuff make sure it make sure you're fruit future proofed <laughs> how, how would you you um relate this to say um capture design or camera design in terms of a another control of being able to use your color space um creatively in other words, you're capturing it by eliminated shifting, changing as you're capturing. So you're actually in the same way that, that Leica kind of manifests in their, their mo monochrome, a certain look, which is different than, say, a translation of a color uh, image to black and white. In the monochrome, there's a certain glow, there's a certain way by, by only having the images uh, connect with black or white. Um, mm. that, that creates a, a certain aesthetic. If you could control the color space in a camera so that, um, I guess the, the metaphor would be choosing when I was shooting film, you would shoot Agfa just made those greens vivid and pop and really, really beautiful. And Kodachrome would bold those reds. And, and so your choice of, of film itself 
really kind of put you in a different color space that gave yeah, you some very much, kind of yeah. power. And uh, that's an interesting, you know. Well, uh, it is an interesting approach. thing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I've had cameras in the past. I don't know if my current ones do, but I've had cameras in my past where you can set the JPEG settings to include a specific color profile. Um, often uh, it would be, you'd have a choice of two, <laughs> either yeah. sRGB or Adobe or, RGB. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, um, for, the, for the average consumer out there, um, I think it, the, the cam cameras being able to capture wider dynamic ranges, but also wider color ranges, is I think is, is making things easier because what you've seen in the past is you have a limited dynamic range, so the camera has to fix its exposure all the time, so you have a sliding window there. Um, same with color range. Uh, if you have a limited color range, then the white balance needs to shift over over what you what you're taking. Uh, the moment these things are wider, the capture is wider, you end up with a system that doesn't have to adjust as much because you can capture more. And uh, and and so what will come out of that in, well, with you looking on your iPhone, for example, um, mm -hmm. is going to be more representative of what was captured than before. So it's going to be it's easier like, to uh, capture. Like RAW, it would be like the next version of what RAW sort is. Sort of, yes. Like the expanded raw. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, they, as as photographers, uh, those of us that shoot raw, of course, the, these things really are only output standards. You know, the cap the camera will camera capture what it does, uh, and then the rest of your workflow, the tools, and, you know, digital tools, and the rest of your workflow will will define what happens to that and 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 what it gets squeezed into. I'm less. Uh, I, I'm less well versed in in what a cinema camera would do. I mean, often you know, the, the, often the, all the rage these days is to shoot in a log profile, isn't it? To make sure that you can capture information that that the sensor can can get uh, for you. Uh, that going or you should draw video, your... which nowadays is well, also that a is thing, getting... right? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, it is, um, but it is. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything capable of shooting raw video as far as I no, know. No, you need you, you need some good buffering and you need some fast processing because and, it's basically and fast doing what SSDs we do in stills. for sure. Yeah, you need you need yeah, a decent so, budget. I mean, you're, yeah. you're doing what we do in, yeah. in in still photography anyway. You're just doing it faster, and it's just dumping yep. and then processing and then yep. moving it off. It, it it's I mean, there, there's nothing that a super fast processor <laughs> and and good SSD. <laughs> uh, won't won't cure okay all right a little bit of fun to end on um uh, well actually a teaser and then a little bit of fun uh so next week uh we have the conversation of so what right so so, <laughs> so what about all this stuff that we've been talking about what does it mean to us as consumers right and so next week we're going to have uh, a conversation about a, an hdr video workflow for consumers and this is something that i've been experimenting with uh, you could probably guess already uh, listening to me talk that i only own one ca camera capable of hdr video capture and that is of course my iphone uh, but i've been experimenting around this and just trying to think of it from a, a consumer point of view you know that it, w what is it that we might choose to do what are the benefits what might be the challenges you know what are some of the tools and how do they react to this you know this hdr footage etc etc and we'll come for that next week um for now thinking about things like you know televisions and stuff like that and displays yeah you know, what, what do we think this means right uh, are we all going to buy we're going to buy our new tvs we're gonna, is this going to be like hdr the your tv suddenly going to have the capacity to like drill a hole in the wall behind you it's so bright you know is that is that where we're headed with this stuff <laughs> the development is i mean the development is speeding up and i I, I was born in a time when we still had big glass CRTs, heavy ones, and you would buy one and use it for 20 years. And um, Who are you kidding? You were, born in, you were born in a time when we still had small glass CRTs and they were black <laughs> and white. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but it, it is becoming more normal for people to upgrade their, their tech. So I guess some will go for those new TVs because they will hear the buzzwords and they go, oh, I need that new technology. And um, yeah. 
Yeah, and that it's could, an, could it's an go interesting horribly time. wrong, you know. <laughs> it, it is an interesting time because thinking about this, I thought, okay, well, you know, there was a what, there was a time about I don't know, let's say ten years ago when every television shipped with three D glasses, and uh, but that was a bit of a gimmick, and 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 it never really took off in in the mainstream. Yeah. Um, and then you got you go back a bit further, and you've got the whole Betamax VHS thing, but that was very different because VHS became the consumer standard, where of course Betamax was the standard for professional production. So, you know, do we think perhaps there's a future for all this HDR stuff? Don't forget Video 2000. Production? Don't forget that. <laughs> how could how could excellent I? quality too? <laughs> Sorry. So, Sorry. yeah, no, no, no. It's all good. Well, that's what I say. It's a bit, just a bit, bit of fun, just to think about the the so what of this because you know I see all these you know the these adverts for 8K cameras now. Yeah, 8K cinema cameras. All the YouTubers are going to be doing stuff in 8K. I have to say, personally, I couldn't care less. I don't have anything. I think uh, the biggest resolution display I have is about two and a half K. Uh, uh, and the biggest TV resolution I have is is 1080p. So it's yeah, yeah, 2K, you know, HD. Um, I, 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 I'm I struggling a little bit to think about, is this compelling enough to go out and buy a TV that's just harder to look at because it's too bright? <laughs> you know, you know, the interesting... I think it's less... Less so, about the brightness, yeah. more about the detail. Um, you know, on 8K, for example, in capture, it would be very similar to shooting something in 70 millimeter that will be released in 35 millimeter. You know, you're using it, you're reducing it, you're making copies of it. Of course, it's di different in digital uh, when you're adding effects and layers and all the rest of it so that yeah. the output finally on 35 looks like a good match. But at 8K... A resolution, especially on your phone, just getting it to mount. Uh, I mean, I so you're I in the Betamax camp then, right? Because what you've just described is that it's is is that it's it's really important for the industry and it gives much more flexibility and you know it'd be really powerful, but possibly it's not an output standard and and possibly it's not for uh, you know not not going to get to to the consumer level in quite the same way. Well, it's sad and that. Betamax, as we say it here, um, Sorry. really did <laughs> didn't make it. It was, you know, it was certainly, arguably, by far a better technology, higher quality, et cetera, et cetera. But VHS just had the muscle, the marketing, and all the rest of the stuff. That's a subject for another day. It is indeed. They actually, won. you know, yeah. for me, it is not a question: Do we go out and buy new TVs and stuff? Because. Um, there's a whole new generation out there now who don't buy, buy TVs. They watch their content on their iPads, their iPhones. Um, they might get an iPad Pro for a bigger screen. They, yeah, they the TVs are for old people. So um, we are <laughs> we are looking at a technology that is coming in just by well, your two, three year cycle in which you replace your phone because all our modern iPhones and modern Macs and um, even many modern PC displays are HDR and they have wider color gamuts and it's yeah. it's sneaking in. It's already here. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, I don't think it will. I'm with you. I'm with you on that 100%. And I, I also think that, the, you know, as the, as the, the Gen Y, uh, become millennials, become boomers in their own way. Uh, they start to have families, build homes. Th they'll there will be technology wherein a wall of your home will be an LED. No, fine no, no, LED no, 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 Entertainment, different kinds of light. You know what? You know what? Uh, this sounds. This sounds like one of those 1950s visions of the future that you're just talking about. The flying cars Black and mirror. the Jetsons it's family, Black you know, <laughs> or Black Mirror. Okay. Jet, oh well, the Jetsons, one yeah. or the other. It's Jetsons. It's the, it's the Jetsons, it, or, or to, uh, <laughs> the, the the original Total Recall. I think had that in it as well, didn't it? <laughs> We'll um, figure this out. Maybe well, there we go. We'll see it in the future. So you heard it here, folks. <laughs> first, you heard it here. We, we we are now setting the strategy for the whole of the the visual arts industry uh, right here on this podcast. Well, it's <laughs> our job. Right. It's our job, isn't it? Um, it is. It is. All right. Let us 
let us move on to the picks of the week. Um, ah, where is this? Okay, I, I brought one. I brought one that directly relates to oh. what we talked about. Yeah, your one is a bit freaky, isn't it, actually? Yeah, mine, mine is a bit freaky. So if you are on a half modern Mac or an iPhone or an iPad, any Apple device pretty much, um, I want you to go to that link that's uh, in the show notes called A Wider White. And that is, uh, and open that in Safari. That is important in the Safari browser. Does it not work on Chrome then? <clears throat> no, it doesn't. <laughs> um, uh, I don't okay. think it does. So the, the thing is, look at the white on your screen. You cannot have your screen on full brightness. You can only have it on slightly reduced brightness. So not full brightness, just a bit reduced. And then look at the white on your screen, like white web pages, white backdrops, and so on. And then when you open that page, what you will see is that on that white background, you will see the word white and it is even whiter than the absolute white on your screen i could <laughs> i cannot show you the thing is let me open this uh this browser here so you what can't you show us on youtube <laughs> well what what you see here on on on, on the video is a, a display capture when i look at this window on my screen i see the letters white w h i uh, w h i t e on my screen, wider than the background. It does not capture because it's on the display side. I, I took a photo of it just to show you what I'm actually seeing. Um, hmm. So to test this out on, on Safari, and what this web page does is it switches a part of your browser window into an HDR mode by doing some trickery and then is displays it more pixel nits. Level? Sorry? It's not is at a pixel doing level, it at no. Pixel level. Well, I guess oh. it does it at a pixel level. What it does, it, it actually plays an invisible HDR video. So it switches your browser uh. to HDR mode, and then it can specify the brightness for the text white on the screen as more than those 255 uh, maximum brightness values. So it okay. is weird, and it uses uh, it, it tricks us. And um, there are web pages that use that to, to display HDR content to you on your display. It it's is interesting. It's, I have a. I've got two displays in front of me right now. I have uh, a 2017 iPad Pro, mm -hmm. um, and that's not capable of displaying it because it doesn't have an uh, HDR uh, capability built in. Yes. No, it, that's right. Yeah, and I have uh, a, a 2021 um, uh, MacBook Pro, uh, which which does display it. Um, uh, because we're recording, my phone is in airplane mode, but I'm sure my phone, your phone will, be able will show to it. it as well. Yes, yeah, your yeah. phone will show it as well. Very in, interesting. In general, somewhat recent uh, Apple devices in Safari will show you that. So yeah, it's mm. it's just a it's just a bit of a trick on on uh, fun. perception. <laughs> anyway, we have more uh, more picks of the week, and one is this one. Oh, that's interesting. Here? Yeah, I've given you a link and it's not come up on your screen. Um, so, okay, so so my ah, link here um, we cannot find is, the page. is proof proof that HDR isn't necessary if, as Jeremiah says, you have good stories. <laughs> so I am at the moment, I have gone back to watch uh, a TV series uh, nearly 20 years old now made here in the UK called Spaced. Uh, ah. And it is it is a sitcom which which many many geeks amongst us will know, uh, and uh, it is it, kind of a cult classic. Um, written it does. It, by, is, it was never on in Germany. That's why it's not on my on my available pages <laughs> here. Ah, I see. Well, okay. Well, so so this is this is my link. So this is uh, the, one of the people behind it the, the, that has be, gone on to do huge amounts of stuff uh, is Simon Pegg, who, mm -hmm. as far as I am aware, is the only person ever to have an acting role in both Star Trek and Star Wars. I think he's the only person still to have done that. And that's just that's just the power of how geeky he is. It is you know, no, nobody else can claim that. But but check out Spaced. It's a fantastic show. And for those of you who might have seen movies that came afterwards, things like Shaun of the Dead or Hot Fuzz, which is a favourite of mine, this is what Simon Pegg did before he did those. Anyway, all good. He's not the only one, by the way. Big team effort. There are lots of other people involved, but that's the name you might recognise. Yeah. 
Cool. So, uh, my, Jeremiah, what did you bring us? My, uh, just an exploration of some interesting photography. Mugshots from the 1920s. <laughs> <laughs> A must. <laughs> Uh, there, there's little I want to say about these, except they're really extraordinary. Uh, just the, the light, the capture, the faces. Uh, and I don't think these were done in high dynamic range. No, but it's all large <laughs> format. They're done on tin types. Large it's, format. It's all large format, which, which gives lot. them amazing depth. I mean, this is just... Amazing. They are, they are uh, amazing. Done, uh, done by really good craftsmen behind the camera. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I got down this rabbit hole and uh, I kept thinking, God, would I like to see some prints of these? This is mm. art. Yeah, Beautiful. this is art. It's fantastic. It's good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. And just the, the way they're posed and the oh, attitude. Oh, and of course, and, uh, I mean, these are gangsters, right? They are dressed yeah. <laughs> in suits with hats and bow ties. Oh, I and I, mean, I know. So, so art can come from uh, the oddest places. Look at this with the blackboard with their names on it. I, I think that's great. Yeah, I like the one. The, the image of the four men uh, sat on a bench in front of a blackboard, smirking. Smir <laughs> yes, and and their names have been written in chalk on the blackboard behind them. I mean, yeah, yeah that's they. They don't look too worried. No, uh, no they, actually, they yeah. don't. Do they? They look Not fairly really. relaxed. Uh, you know, the, oh, this is a tough girl. Oh, I, they, there's just such amazing, like I said, <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> there, there's no doubt. And you can that, discover uh, you can discover pandemic hairstyles as well, as we see. <laughs> <laughs> there's no doubt that, that uh, mug shots have fallen very, very low oh. compared to the early versions. <laughs> uh, it's very disappointing. Those were art, oh, art shots. Can I, can, I have a, can I have a last parting shot, actually, just before we go, Chris? Of course. Um, can, yeah, which I haven't put in a link for you, but there's, there's a new game just about to be released, which I think Jeremiah might like, uh, or maybe not, I don't know. Uh, it's called Pokemon Snap. <laughs> Pokemon and it is a Pokemon Snap. game that is available that that is very much uh, built around in-game photography <laughs> oh no <laughs> and you can oh, have dear. your photo taken with your favorite pokemon oh and my stuff goodness like well there you it may go. not be your usual fodder jeremiah i know you're more of an assassin's <laughs> creed kind of a guy but like <laughs> yeah definitely but you know you can mash them up that could be fun <laughs> it's I in mean, other words yeah. Any any anything would, that re anything that includes some level of photography and brings photography closer to kids, I mean that that must be a good thing, right? Yeah. Well, I'm now inspired to take some of these Pokemon and put them in Assassin's Creed. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that might be go. funny. That might be fun. <laughs> New NFTs coming soon. <laughs> yeah, coming definitely. very soon. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Check it out on Foundation <laughs> Tin Roof. <laughs> this is wild. This is very oh, well. Wild. Just a little bit, of, just a little bit of fun there with the Pokemon stuff. I'm not sure that I'm. It's a full price game. It's it's pricey, so um, seems seems uh, seems that they think that's viable. Maybe the world of in-game photography well, is now a market in its own right. I'm I'm pretty sure we're we're going to see a lot more of these from uh, Jeremiah pretty soon. So um, <laughs> yeah, be, count on it. Wouldn't be so <laughs> next week. Got to catch them all, Jeremiah. <laughs> All right, I think um, collect them all. it's time to say goodbye until next week. And uh, everyone, take care and uh, go and check out the show notes. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. <laughs>